Yes, so this is a fairly recent research topic that we started with two uh, former students of mine, the Kenzo Alasis and Espanol. They, they're now both postdocs at the University of Padua, which is me. Uh, we have just had, so the topic is recent, and we have just uh, had our first um, small funding related to this topic. The project is called pa Padua. Padua, it sounds like Padua, but it's not totally by chance because we submitted the project and we titled it Virtual Auditory Display, no, uh, Personal Auditory Displays for Virtual Acoustics. And after that, we realized that the, the acronym was Padua. So. <laughs> That's not the name of the project. Just started. It's a small funding from, from the University of Padova. Um, so, uh, the topic is uh, um, 3D sound through uh, binaural rendering techniques. That means uh, basically through headphones or at least through a stereo signal that is delivered to, to, uh, via two channels that has, have to be independent. Of, there has to be no cross talk between the two channels. So this happens with headphones. If you use two uh, loudspeakers, you have to add some cross talk cancellation techniques to make the, these uh, techniques work. But more specifically, the topic is the, of our research is about uh, developing techniques for making this uh, 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 moral rendering methods. Uh, personalized and uh, adaptable to an individual listener because uh, I, I will try to explain to you or maybe you might know that, that uh, uh, the way we perceive spatial information related to sounds, acoustic spatial information is very much dependent on our individual anthropometry and anthropometric features on uh, how our own body is shaped so if we want to simulate that, we have to take this uh, uh, aspect uh, into account. So I will first give you a, a very quick introduction to, to the general topic, to the background. Then I'll go to our research about uh, what are the technologies that we are developing. In particular, I will spend some words on this uh, definition of mixed, uh, mixed structure models that has been coined by, by Michele in particular. It's been the title of his PhD thesis, which is summarizes in a way our, our approach. And then I will talk briefly about uh, an application uh, scenario where we are using, currently using, using these techniques. Um, so I said uh, we're, we're using headphones. So why? Um, of course this has advantages and disadvantages. If you want to, you, you can deliver sounds uh, with uh, spatial information using arrays of loudspeakers. Uh, there are uh, lots of techniques to do that nowadays, uh, wave field synthesis is very much uh, studied. That means that you can move inside a space uh, and have the impression of, of the sound field uh, generated by a real source or a set of a source located in space. Instead, uh, uh, using headphones means that your display is uh, individual, you are the only one listening to that. And also it means that uh, uh, you, if you want to make something that is uh, really enjoyable, you, you should also have some technologies to track the, the head movements of the users, uh, because otherwise the, the spatial information is not coherent with the movement of the user in the, in the real space. But still, using headphones is uh, an attractive option because nowadays everything is mobile. And, mobile phone and uh, so these kind of techniques have, have some, have some, also some uh, space for, for exploitation possibly some, some products. So this was, it, uh, this is how it was like in, in the 90s with big Walkman CD players and then small earphones in your uh, ears. I actually remember how it was in the 80s for that so CDs. And uh, today it's, it's a little bit like that. So mm -hmm. you, you have uh, everything is miniaturized. You, you may have seen this on the internet. Everything is small. You have digital music, but the emphasis is on the on the, on the headphones. You can basically carry the same weight, but uh, everything is now here around your, your your ears. 
And um, another interesting uh, scenario that is coming along is related to so-called augmented reality. You know? uh, now, this used to be a, a um, keyword using in, the, in scientific research nowadays. It, it's a buzzword and that, that has landed into the, the media because Google is uh, pushing these Google classes where you got augmented reality. You see the real world and you see some additional information on, on superimposed to it. But Google classes that do not have uh, integrated earphones. On the other hand, there are other products like these small earphones that are sold by Roland, but I think there are similar things by other uh, companies where you have a uh, earphones and mics integrated into the same device so you, do, so you can do augmented reality in this, on this device as well because you can just connect the microphone to the uh, speaker of the earphones and so have this device which is completely transparent to the uh, acoustic information coming from the real world you don't even realize you have ear, you're wearing earphones because everyone, everything is passing through transparently but you can add some additional things on top of it acoustically. So you can have acoustic uh, augmented reality. And people, is, even in uh, scientific research, I've seen a paper just last week on, in, on in some ACI uh, conference. People is starting to look at these devices and they found that they're used for, also for delivering special sound. So, um, okay, so that, that, this is about the people in this place. But the, the other um, point is that we are looking at individualized displays. That means that, uh, as I mentioned before, we are all very different in terms of how our, um, how our, our body, bodies are shaped. And particularly our external ears, our penis, are very different from each other. You may know that the, the penis is also being used as a, in, in, um, in biometrics. Because it's very much, uh, it, it identifies very precisely a single subject because of its shape. So there, are, there is research on PINA, automatic PINA recognition and classification algorithms and these kind of things in, in biometrics. Um, and so we want to uh, take this in, into account. So these are not what we call these uh, mug shots. No? These are not <laughs> my shots of, of us after being arrested. These are uh, these us in, in the lab <laughs> taking measures of our uh, penis. Um, this is okay. yeah, this is more than those are some master students of ours who collaborate with the, the research. And we want to embed this information in our uh, rendering. Um, okay, a little bit of background. Uh, I may say obvious things to you here. Uh, I, can, I can skip things if you all think that these are not uh, uh, useful. But uh, I just want to say that uh, we're concentrating on the uh, external ear. Yes, external ear. So what we are taking into account is connected with the, 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 the shape of, uh, of the pinna and also to the, to the ear canal, up to the up to the timpani. Um, because what happens before the, the timpani, the, the ear drum, um, uh, is what uh, creates information related to uh, spatial, to the position of sound in space. So basically, what we have is that uh, our head acts as a, a diffractor for the sound. Uh, our um, body, also the torso, the, the, the shoulders, uh, add some, some reflections to incoming rays or can add some uh, acoustic shadow is the sound is coming from, from below. Uh, and the pin and the external ears add the, uh, uh, also reflections due to the, uh, to the contours of the pinna and resonances because this is a small resonance. And then, of course, the, the room, the, the environment, the, the 
indoor environment where we are staying also has a, has a role in this. All these parts of our body uh, uh, create the, the information that we exploit in the successive uh, steps of processing that are, are not uh, dealing with to uh, infer some information of the sound coming to us, the, the position of the sound coming to us. So a little bit more in detail, the, the head I said is uh, the factor, so if you think of a sound source somewhere around us, uh, when the uh, front wave uh, reaches our head, uh, there are two main effects. First of all, uh, the sound, with the front wave, the wave front sound, sorry, the wave front reaches uh, the, the uh, ipsilateral ear earlier than the contralateral ear, so there's a, a difference in the arrival time of the, of the wave front to, to our ears. This is called ITD, interoral time difference. The other, the other effect is that uh, sounds diffract uh, around the head, so the contralateral ear receives less energy than the ipsilateral ear. Uh, so the, the, there's a shadow, and this is called the intraoral level difference. And these two features, these are two binaural features, that means that you need to have two ears to, to, uh, have, to generate these features. And uh, these two features are uh, the basis of uh, Lord uh, Rayleigh uh, uh, duplex theory about sound mechanization. Uh, that means that it's a duplex theory in the sense that they are complementary because the uh, ITD works in, in low frequency range because very generally if, if the wavelength is very short it, it becomes less uh, obvious to estimate this ITD if the, uh, yeah, if it's it obvious. And um, while the ILD, the interoral level difference, works in the uh, high frequency range because for, for long wavelengths or for uh, uh, low frequencies, the head is transparent to the sound because if, if the wavelength is comparable to your head size, there's no diffraction for, for that wavelength. So the, these are um, um, complementary in a way. Ideally, in reality, what happens is that in a room like this, we have a reverberation, and this kind of effect degrades the information related to the ITD. So it's very, uh, because you are receiving a reflected rays all the time, and you are not able to estimate the ITD uh, precisely. That means that you have no reliable information in the low frequency in a real environment. And that is why you have uh, uh, surround systems with uh, several small speakers and one subwoofer because you don't care where low frequency uh, frequencies are generated. Okay, but that's a, this is only part of the story because uh, um, the, the duplex theory work, works pretty well in the uh, horizontal plane explains pretty well how you localize sounds along the horizontal plane. But if you are thinking about sound localization in the vertical plane, that's a different story, and uh, that's where the, the external ear comes into uh, play because the external ear adds uh, uh, resonances and reflections, as I said, and these are very much, especially reflections, are very much dependent on the elevation because because of the shape of this these contours here. So the, the reflections means notches in the, in the frequency response because there are some frequencies, uh, reflections uh, are connected to some frequencies that uh, are such that reflected rays are in anti-phase due to the direct rays and so there are some certain frequencies that get proximately cancelled so you see notches holes in the, in the frequency response. And this change very much with the, with the elevation. Then, uh, to a minor extent, uh, we should also take into account uh, the effect of the torso, how the torso generates uh, its own reflections and uh, uh, possibly acoustic, uh, additional acoustic shadow if the sound source is very uh, much below the, the listener. But these effects are, are less well understood. Uh, so, 
at the end of it, you can summarize everything in these functions, in these uh, head-related transfer functions. Head-related transfer functions is simply the transfer function between the sound generated at the sound source position and the signal that you can uh, uh, measure at the either at the entrance of the ear uh, canal or at the ear trunk. The, you can measure head-related transfer functions in, in both ways. And uh, here's an example taken from a, a database, the CI, CICIC database. Here you can see the, the frequency response, the amplitude response uh, along frequency and uh, azimuth, so the uh, horizontal angle. So you, here we are on the horizontal plane, and you see that the, the frequency response has uh, this shape, has this shape. Here you have the same thing, another slice of these uh, frequency responses. In this case, we are looking at what happens along the elevation, phi, phi, phi is elevation. So we are looking at this. And you can see these notches here, they are changing very much with, with elevation, while they are not changing that much with, uh, you know, along with the horizontal line. So those notches are those. Um, are due to the to the pin to the to the reflections of the pin. But these things depend a lot on the individual anthropometric data. Uh, the same database, uh, the CIBIC database, um, has uh, measures uh, recorded the uh, HRTFs for uh, uh, large set of users, and they also it's it's pretty old, but it was done in 2000. Uh, but it's very still very useful because they took uh, uh, measure anthropometric measures of all, of all their users. So that, that's part of the documentation of the database. <coughs> so you can try to relate those numbers with the, with the, with the relevant features of the responses. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, how do you measure these chartiers? You need uh, Proper settings. You need uh, uh, an echoic chamber. You need uh, in-ear microphones. Uh, you need a set of loudspeakers around the listener. Uh, or if you are smart enough, maybe you can have only one loudspeaker and turn the, the listener. But you can turn it like this, not possibly not, not like this. So it, it's uh, it's not so easy to. Um, get a set of individual uh, head-related transfer function, and that's another motivation for our work. You know, we don't have uh, the facilities to uh, provide any user, with, uh, any listener, any subject with uh, his or uh, her own uh, head-related transfer functions. We want to find alternative ways to provide him with something which is as close as possible to his head-related transfer functions without measuring them in, in the anechoic chamber. Um, since uh, having these measures is so uh, difficult and expensive and time-consuming, uh, many people use uh, mannequins, uh, head, like th this kind of guys to measure the transfer functions. Uh, because they don't complain, they, they stay still, uh, they usually have uh, microphones cabled in, into, into their ears already, so it's, it's fairly easy to do these measures. This, this one here is the Kenma mannequin, it's a commercial product uh, by the Dutch company Trust, G uh, This is actually one of Possibly the most used one. We have one in we bought one. We have one in Padua. So it, it, it's 40 years old, but it's still used. They say it's uh, shaped uh, based on some you know, average anthropometric measures uh, for uh, the Caucasian male or something like that. But I'm not sure how this was done exactly. But it, it should be sort of an average listener. And you can see you can change, you can change uh, his ear if you want, or you, or you can remove his ear to measure the, the penalized uh, trans 
also functions of this guy. Then there are other uh, dummies. The, the Neumann is very famous, but it's not uh, conceived for, for, for measurements in the lab. It's more about musical application, about recording, binaural recording in the studio. And there are other ones. So, well, I said that the camera is 40 years old. In fact, last year, um, the company released a sort of a booklet to celebrate uh, the, the birthday, the 40th birthday of this guy. So they have this booklet with a lot of pictures of researchers <laughs> working, with the, working with the camera. And so, so this guy is sort of a rock star in the, in the scientific community. They also say that it's, it's <laughs> you cannot read these poker faces, so <laughs> how they celebrate this, this universe. Um, okay, so that, that, that is one of the databases that you have, that we have. There are many others, so that's another issue that I want to uh, uh, enter into. But uh, there are many databases with different formats, uh, with different uh, uh, Conventions uh, even about uh, the, the, uh, the reference system, uh, about uh, the type of microphones used, uh, the, the positioning of the microphones, the um, sampling frequency, uh, and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, current uh, uh, trend of research is concerned about uh, finding some standards for, for these databases that are now quite many, there are quite many of them, finding some common standard to, to uh, provide a unified description of all this data and, and related metadata, uh, especially anthropometric data as I mentioned, that are very, very, very important. So um, this, this was a fairly long introduction to make the point that uh, uh, usually, uh, very often when you listen to special, special sound delivered through headphones, you listen to uh, the transfer functions of the camera uh, mannequin, uh, which is, who is not you, and uh, uh, you can hear that. And so the, the perception that you have about uh, the special, special features of the sound is not precise. There are several issues that are well known. And there are front back confusions, for, for instance, that are very, very common. So you, you tend to, you can, easily uh, confuse the sound which is coming from uh, uh, the frontal direction you perceive it to be located in the back uh, or um, you have a very little externalization of the sound so you, you hear everything inside your head instead of hearing it uh, perceiving it outside outside you and this kind of thing so having your own transfer functions is very important to, in order to have a reliable and a satisfactory uh, perception of acoustic spatial features. Okay, but so we don't have this possibility, I mean we don't have the possibility of measuring uh, the transfer functions of everyone. So this is a general picture of the um, uh, framework that we are working in. Uh, we are developing models of the that related transfer functions. That's the main one that I will address in the remainder of my talk. Uh, this, and I will talk about this uh, mixed structural modeling approach. But uh, on the other hand, uh, on top of this, you want to have some uh, way to. Uh, uh, tune this general model to an individual subject based on its own anthropometry. So you need some uh, device to uh, capture the, the relevant anthropometric features, you need a camera or something like that, and you need some uh, image processing to extract the relevant features, and, and then you need some uh, uh, ideas about how to map that those into the features of the, of the HRTS to the parameters of the model. Then we will also need some uh, ideas about how to deliver everything to, to the listener. So you have 
headphones, that's for sure. We need probably some uh, head tracking device. We have been working with this uh, Olympi system, which is an actual device that you can, very, very small that you can attach on the headphones. You also need some uh, headphone compensation techniques. Uh, I will not uh, talk about this, but we are also working about compensating the not only the uh, frequency response of the headphones because you want, I mean, in music, if you want to enjoy your music, you usually don't want your headphone to have a flat response. The commercial headphones have some uh, some. Uh, Boosting of uh, low frequencies uh, that makes make them sound better, but in this case we want them to be exactly flat because we don't want to corrupt all the information that we are trying to, to simulate and to generate with our models. A more interesting aspect is that you want also to compensate to individual effects in when when a subject is wearing headphones because the sound is delivered from the headphone to the eardrum of the listener and during this path to, from the headphone to the eardrum you are also adding again some individual effects uh, with external ear of the, of the listener so you, ideally you want to remove that as well so you want to have a perfectly flat uh, response from, from the sound file to the eardrum in order to add the, the, the model Okay, so that's the, the general scenario. I will mainly talk about this, this part that I mentioned. Um, again, a little bit of background. Uh, uh, these mixed structure models that we, have, uh, uh, we are developing are based on this structural modeling approach, which is already quite old. <coughs> the first paper uh, about this approach was published in 1998 by Brown and uh, people in UC Davis. Uh, Algazi and uh, other, other people at UC Davis, the same people who published the, the CIP IC database. And their idea was to do a sort of physical modeling, a simple physical modeling of the head related transfer function uh, by simulating each uh, single part of the body which is responsible for those effects that I mentioned before with very simple uh, components. So, basically linear filters describing diffraction around the head, describing reflections and resonances of, of the ear, describing effects of the torso, possibly adding also boom effects, injecting uh, early reflections into these filters also as well in order to so specialize also the reflections of the room. And they call this the structural modeling approach because you have this structure into the, the, the filter structure that you are uh, designing the filter blocks that you are putting together. Um, of course there are many other approaches to the, the, for, for synthetic uh, um, HRTFs. And uh, the only uh, additional thing that I want to say here is that uh, another word that we'll be using when we get a lot of talk is this partial head-related intrusive responses. That means that once you have understood that different parts of the body are responsible for different effects into the HRTF, you can talk about partial head-related intrusive responses, meaning that you can isolate the uh, intrusive response or the equivalent of the, the transfer function uh, of one single body part. So you, you can measure, or you may be able to measure, the uh, inputs, uh, the transfer functions of the external ear alone. You can do that easily with the camera, you can do that less easily with the human subject, living subject, although uh, Simone has done this in Helsinki, when he was visiting the Art Lab in Helsinki, he set up a very complicated uh, uh, device uh, where people had to put their ear into a hole and then he tried to, to Measure that, and we published a data together with the Puig. They published a, a database of pinna related impulse responses, small database. Or you can simulate them with fine compressing. 
Um, so we have this uh, mixed structural modeling that I have been talking about. Uh, basically, this is well, really quite late. This is the main idea. Um, we want to. So we are extending the idea of the structural modeling approach by um, uh, in, by assuming that we can combine, uh, we can construct uh, an HRTF that matches as closely as possible the, 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 the two HRTF of a single individual. We can construct this one by combining different parts, different partial related transfer functions related to different parts of the body, and, and these parts can be either uh, synthetic, like a filter representing the, the the response of a sphere that can approximate the effect of the diffraction due to your head can be synthetic or can be measured uh, in the lab. So you can combine measured and synthetic components uh, that can be components of the individual that you are trying to target or components measured on other subjects in a database. So this, this equation should, should tell you that this approximated uh, HRTF that matches the, the HRTF uh, of, the, of subject I is a combination, this can be it's a general symbol to indicate either series or parallel connections of, of filters. Um, it's a combination of uh, partial HRTFs of other subjects in, in the database that you are choosing and based on, of course, on some optimization of some criterion to choose them, uh, can include some uh, components of the subject itself, but we want, ideally, we want this to disappear because we want to avoid, uh, escape the need of measuring a single subject. And uh, plus some combination of other modeled components. So, uh, depending on, on the value of this capital S, capital E, and capital I, capital N, uh, you can have different, uh, different uh, sub-cases. Uh, if uh, S and I are zero and uh, uh, you only have uh, model components, this is a structural model in the sense of Brown and Duda. If uh, you only have uh, S is one and <coughs> I and M are zero, you have a set, uh, some sort of selection procedure to pick up a single HRTF uh, from a database of a subject that matches, in some sense, the, the HRTF of uh, your target subject, and so on. So that's the general idea. Um, what we have done, so this tries to formalize our ideas, but we've done a, a, a small part of our this we fill the uh, not many parts of this uh, scenario. I want to uh, say a few more words about the the pinna, so the, the partial the partial transfer function related to the pinna. Um, basically, what we've done here, this is where we have obtained some I think interesting results. Uh, so if you look at uh, a response, the response of the pin alone, I don't remember what elevation this is, but this is the frequency response at a certain elevation due to the pin alone. Um, you see that there are resonances and notches. You can think that resonances are due to well, air oscillating inside these cavities, inside this resonator. These are, have been measured the many times so on modern or years or obviously in all months of years. Uh, while you can think that uh, reflection notches are due to re reflections on some of these contours, this is not entirely uh, correct because we, it's not so clear that you can use this ray tracing uh, uh, approach uh, with, with, the, uh, with these uh, sizes and, and, uh, and wavelengths. But, uh, this is what uh, people usually, how people usually explain the, the appearance of these notches in, in the previous response. So first of all, we, uh, three years ago, we developed a simple algorithm to, of 
automatically separate this response into its resonant part and into, into its reflective parts. So to obtain two components, one containing only the resonance and the other one containing only the notches approximately, to estimate those uh, as precisely as possible. And we developed a, a simple filter structure that uh, is able to fit that kind of response. So you have uh, two resonances. It is known that there are two main resonances that we can see in the, in the, in the response. And uh, there are usually three main notches that we can see in the, in the difference in response. So this is a simple filter structure with two resonances in front of and the two, uh, and three, three notches in the uh, in, uh, in, in series. Uh, and if you tune uh, all the parameters of this, these are second in our first implementation, these are second order filters. You can tune the parameters to fit fairly well uh, these kind of responses. But the point is how to derive these parameters uh, or, or to estimate how these responses would look like without having them. So, only the subject and looking at the subject. And this was the next step. So we tried to apply a very simple uh, idea, uh, which is, uh, let's say that we are able to uh, track all the relevant contours uh, along the tina. Um, we assume that uh, uh, acoustic rays are reflecting on, on these contours. So we know that there are certain frequencies that will be cancelled. These are those frequencies that uh, satisfy this equation. So that means that the, the path that uh, is traveled by the reflected wave, the reflected ray, uh, is uh, half of the wavelength, uh, the additional path that is traveled by the reflected wave ray with respect to the direct ray. And now is half the wavelength, wavelength of, the, of this particular ray, <coughs> this will be cancelled. So we have a very simple geometric argument to say that uh, if uh, we have for a certain elevation, we have this contour, and this contour has a certain distance uh, from the ear canal, we know that uh, approximately this frequency will be cancelled, there will be a notch there. And we try to apply this hypothesis to the CIPIC database, to a set of subjects there, uh, more than 20 subjects. Uh, Professor Agassi was so kind to provide us with all the, the pictures of the beams of these subjects, so we, we could work on the real uh, pictures. And uh, we verified that uh, in uh, all cases there are three contours that uh, are likely responsible for the three main notches that we see along all elevations. So we have this, uh, um, we have this uh, result that means that we can, uh, means two things for us. It means that we can fit our model, our filters to anthropometry, or individual anthropometry, or uh, that this is also interesting to me, it also means that we can use this sort of uh, uh, measure of distance between years to uh, in, in for a selection criterion. I mean that if we know that these three contours are the most relevant for, for defining the notches in the <coughs> response, we can define a, a distance between two different years in terms of uh, some combination of the Euclidean distance of uh, these contours of the two years. And we can use this as a, criteria, a distance criteria to pick up uh, a given HRTF or PRTF in a database given a subject. So this can also be a selection criteria. Just a few examples. So this, well, let's see this one. So this, this is a toy example, but it should illustrate uh, all the things that I mentioned before. Imagine that we, you will want to resynthesize the HRTF of the camera guy. Uh, you can use a mixed uh, structural model according to the definition that they gave, where you have uh, uh, one, uh, uh, how is it, uh, um, two components, uh, 
uh, one is modeled and one is uh, uh, one is model and one is individual. So m is one, m is one, i is one, and s is zero. In this case, we have uh, modeled the response of the pin. So this is the response of the pin uh, synthesized with our model. You can see these three notches changing with, with elevation. This is elevation here. This is so you can change the part. You can see the, the, the part of these notches when you uh, change the elevation. While this one is uh, uh, an individual component, that is, this is the true response of the uh, torso of the, the of the camera, and you can construct the, the overall HRTF by combining these components. One is model, one is measured. This is what you obtained, and this is the true uh, response of the, of the camera head. So of course they're not the same, but uh, uh, it, show for us that this general idea can work. Or, as I said, the other interesting uh, scenario is the selection. So you have a database of HRPFs, uh, you have a new user coming in, and you want to pick up from this database the, the best uh, HRPF for this user. So this is again a sub-case of this general uh, definition of, uh, of a mixed structural model, where you have only one uh, selected component from, from another subject. So you have one component which is the whole HRPF. And uh, you make the selection based on uh, a distance, uh, as I said, uh, constructed from the, the, the distance of uh, these two tours. We have some uh, preliminary results here. Actually, we can see one where at ICASP, so, uh, ICASP uh, last week and we presented these results where we made a, a very preliminary listening experiment, a localization experiment, using uh, uh, the camera as a baseline, so subject has to uh, perform a localization task in the vertical plane, uh, using headphones and using uh, uh, the camera as a baseline. Using uh, um, and using two different uh, distances constructed, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, by combining the different waves, weights, these, uh, these Euclidean distances between these two contours. And these are the results. And what is this is still very preliminary, but you see that performance with the camera is extremely poor. That is, that basically people provide random responses when they are asked to do localizes sound in the plane. While with these two distances, there are slightly different one. The first one uh, gives uh, um, more emphasis to the first notch, while the other weights, the, the three notches, you will see weight. Uh, but in any case, you see a, a clear improvement in the performance. So these are some, some, some potential. Of course, it's very brilliant because these distances are are just uh, two possible choices between all, all possible choices, but uh, the, the information that uh, we think is there. Um, okay, I think I have to conclude. I will just uh, give you a very quick uh, overview of what we are doing in a specific application scenario where 3D sound can be uh, exploited. And this is uh, working with um, blind subjects. This is done in collaboration with uh, the Italian Institute of Technology in Genova. Uh, they work on haptics a lot. They, have developed, they are developing a, a system, hardware software system to um, uh, provide uh, blind users with uh, the capability of exploring offline a certain indoor environment, so if you imagine that these people can have a, a tool for uh, exploring with their hands how a certain room is, is uh, configured, where are the walls, where are the obstacles, where, where are certain objects in the room. Uh, for this they use a very simple haptic uh, device, which is called the, the TAMO, uh, which is basically a mouse where you have a lever uh, under your uh, finger, 
which can, can move up and so the, the idea is that you explore this uh, surface as you were exploring it with, with your finger and you can feel uh, the, the obstacles and the, the uh, changing heights of your, your scenario. And we are adding sound into this uh, application. And the interesting thing is that haptics and sound in this uh, scenario are very much complementary because haptics provide you with very uh, local information. You are there, you can hear that there is a bump, and then you move away and you have to remember that there was a bump there. While the way we are using sound is that we are uh, sort of uh, um, putting some uh, anchor sound in this environment, which is, provides you with global information. So wherever you are, you can hear the sound and you know where you are relatively to this sound. So you have a global information that complements very well the, the haptic information. And we've done a few experiments about reaching a certain point in the scene with haptic and or uh, auditory feedback, about uh, reconstructing the shape of an object or even more interesting, interesting for the application that we are targeting at, about localizing and estimating the size of an object in, in a scene. So basically you have virtual cubes in the scene and you have to, uh, once you find them, you, you can explore them and after, after having explored them for a given amount of time, you have to uh, say where this cube was in the scene and how big it was. And uh, sound uh, provides uh, the, the addition of sound to this, uh, to this application mm, uh, improves very much the, the, the performance of the users. And of course, we are using the techniques uh, that I showed you before. In particular, we are using this last uh, uh, application that we have developed with this selection technique. We have a database and for each user we take the picture of his uh, pinna and we pick up the, the best uh, match in terms of HRTF in the database. Uh, so that's it, I think. There are many things that I have not talked about. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the theme of individual, individual headphone compensation is quite interesting to me. Uh, one problem that we have with the evaluation is that we don't have we don't have a, another coil chamber in Padova, and not even close to Padova, so we don't have our own um, uh, HRTFs, true HRTFs, measured HRTFs. So whatever is the evaluation procedure that we set up, we don't have the ground to, 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 to evaluate the performance because we cannot deliver our listeners up listeners to, with their own true HRTFs. So one possibility is to simulate them with uh, 3D meshes, seven meshes then. Um, yeah, and we're also working on the other pieces of the puzzle that I haven't talked about in terms of automatic uh, extraction of, the, of these features. This is, this is uh, image processing, uh, artificial vision, artificial vision topic. Not our job, but there are quite uh, established techniques that can be applied to extract these contours in an auto automatic fashion. So you can think of a product where you, with your mobile you can take some pictures of you and generate automatically your, your HRTS or, or maybe embed the camera into directly in, into your headphones and have one single device, a headphone augmented with the camera and the, a head tracker which does everything provide you with the individual specialized audio. That's it. If you have any questions. Thank you. Criteria. 
Okay, so in efficiency, you have the computational efficiency. No, 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 no. The in terms of rotary, and if you do for the organization task with subjects and to. Right. Well, what, what we did so far is to apply very classic uh, experimental protocols that we used in, in sample acoustics to, to, to measure uh, listener capabilities in spatial in the recognition of, of, of uh, sound and space. So, look, as I mentioned before, localization experiments where we ask the user to provide to, uh, a measure of where he thinks the sound is located. The, the, the synthesized sound, the render itself is located, and you, you measure the, the performance of these users. And we are, we're using very fairly standard protocols. That's why we're taking from the users and the horizontal uh, level of the head of the earth, asking, as sending the sound and asking, for example, the angle. And exactly. Exactly, except that we, we are mostly interested in, in the vertical, yes. uh, vertical localization because this is where our approach should be, should provide the plus with respect to the existing uh, approaches. Because all these uh, features related to the PINA are especially relevant for vertical localization. So, but that, that's the more or less what, what we ask users. Uh, then the, there's the point that how you how you should ask users to uh, respond because uh, usually you have, a, and that's what we're doing, you, you have a simple graphical interface and the user, listeners use the mouse and put uh, a dot where they think the sound uh, is coming from. This might be not very reliable or accurate because uh, they have to translate their perception into there's a cognitive load that is implied in translating their perception into this answer on a graphical interface. The other approach would be to, that is, has been done as well in the literature, is simply to track the user and, uh, and uh, ask them to point towards the sound where they really think it's coming from. That's, that's probably a more, more ecological way of uh, asking for, for, for an answer. And also about, uh, I've, I've read things about uh, low frequencies that we don't hear, but which also are part of the sound experience. Mm -hmm. um, for example, under 20 years, that something that passed through the body, some kind of transmission of the sound to the air, right. this won't be achieved with binaural. Uh, no, of course not. So if, if, you, if you have a oral uh, listening, you, only, you are only using the, the, the communication way? channel due to air uh, setting into motion the, the ear trump. Anything else, including, uh, as you say, uh, uh, bone conduction, these kind of things, uh, uh, you are not seeing that. Because those can be relevant but not that much relevant as far as localization is concerned. They are relevant for your overall experience, but they not as much for, for features related to spatial location of sound. Because this, this kind of transmission through bones or anything is understood by the brain without passing through all sensors, which is directly from the... It goes directly to here, this information bypasses completely the outer, outer and uh, middle ear and uh, goes directly, sets into motion like completely the, I would say, the oval window and then the vascular membrane. So it's, uh, that's the point where, where the signal is injected in your, uh, in your auditory system. That make some some music and work and vibrate and recreate a frequency. So maybe coupling binaural with this kind of device. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I think that there, there's I know that there's research about this about uh, having uh, alternative ways to deliver sound to a listener through direct contact and vibration, like uh, 
vibrations coming from the chair where you're sitting in to add this channel of uh, information which is not purely acoustic. Questions? I have a question I think it's very stupid. But, uh, when you said about the, like you, you separated the transfer function into three different things. So I guess like you can it's like isolate different behaviors due to the like to the to the person who's actually getting that kind of that sound model for them. Um, how do you operate with these three transfer? Do you just convolve the first one, then the second one, then the, like progressively one after the other, or do you have to generate an, a different transfer function that includes the, the three? Uh, because I've never, I've, I've always convolved stuff with just one transfer function. Mm -hmm. And okay, well, uh, basically we, we you have to. Let's put it in this way. We are constructing one single transfer function, which is at the end is one filter, yeah. a simple filter, uh, by connecting different uh, filter blocks, uh, either in series or in parallel. So if, if you think uh, the combination of the head and the, the external ear, you have the, the head response that could be the response of the steer in series with the ear response because you. you the path it works in that way. You know, the sound turns like uh, uh, around your head that re then reaches the ear. So you have the sound that is diffracted around your head and then reaches your external ear. So it's a, a serious connection between, between the two. But in the end, you have one single big filter and you make one convolution or whatever you, you are doing, or you, you are doing in time domain. You are working with one single filter. But you have constructed it by combining different small filters. So you wouldn't convolve with the first partial transfer function, then that you would convolve with the second partial transfer function, and that then you would convolve with the third one. No, you, you would you generate do one one convolution with the, the overall okay. filter structure yeah. that you have to start. Yes, yes. Just for the, for the individual. Uh, um, impulse responses for the various body parts. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you imagine that as just being the body parts from floating there in space, like a pinna just sitting there with nothing around it? And to, yeah. Is that, that, is that the way to think about it? Is, is that uh, that's, I mean, that might be not entirely correct, but it's consistent with the modeling approach. So, you, as uh, I just said, if you are thinking that you, you are separating the components in this, you are combining. Sound diffraction around your head, and then this is fed into the, the pinna. Uh, then it is consistent to simulate the, the pinna alone. Right. What does the blind space. side of the pinna look like then? So, like the the bit that would be on the inside of the pinna, if the pinna is floating. Is this just like a flat surface? If you're assuming that there's a head, there's a gauge <coughs> RTF for the pinna in complete 3D space, it must, it must have some geometry on the blind side. You mean the, the side? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, yeah, of course, but that, that is uh, not relevant. In no. Oh, I mean, I assume it is not relevant because uh, what, what is relevant is this side of the yeah. pinna, where, where the sound uh, hits, hits the ear and then enters the ear canal. So th does that mean that if you take a, say you take the pinna uh, impulse response alone and just that of say a sphere with no ears, like it, it, there seem like there are many ways you could connect and you could set the pinna at different angles. Yeah, you know, of course. Well, that, that, so that, that's, you, you need to have that uh, information as well. Right, so that's, that's, for instance, say if you look at the, um, if you look at the kind of information that they, the metadata that they have in the CIPIC database. Uh, they also have the same information that they have with your head. So, how, how does that angle come into the way in which you combine the two transfer functions then? So, you, you know, like. um, Well, what do you mean? Uh, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. well, Thank you. Do you have something to say? Yeah, 
you let's, let's, let's say that you, you, you have a user, uh, a subject, and you want to generate his uh, functions. You measure you measure all of these relevant uh, anthropometric uh, parameters, including this one, mm -hmm. and then uh, you, you you can. Uh, Ah, okay, you're saying, but then... Well, suppose you just have the banana, you just have a ball, and you want to stick them together to make a, a head with an ear on it. Like, does that mean that mm -hmm. there okay. are many different ways of, of connecting them, depending on how you, you stick the pin on the head, or...? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's true, but you can assume that, uh, uh, I mean, once, once you know, once you know what, what these angles are, you know how to, uh, for instance, simulate the, the, the pinna response uh, in your uh, finite difference. Uh, and uh, you, you simulate that with, with this. Well, because then this is one thing that I have mentioned. Another advantage of uh, having this approach is that you can, since uh, the, the pinna response basically changes only with elevation, Changes very little with the, the azimuth, uh, at least for a certain range. Uh, you can simply measure or simulate these pin responses on, on the medium plane here. Right. So if you want to simulate them, <coughs> you simulate them by putting the pin on the right angle. Okay, so that's, that's fixed already in the measurement. Thing. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about it now, but. That, that's a possible approach. That is, that you, you have to. Uh, I mean, it's not a, anything that we have taken into account so far, but uh, that could be the idea. So you, you have you need to have this information about the user, about the, the subject. What's, what's the angle uh, behind the, the head? Hmm. And then, if you want to simulate it, uh, you, you uh, take the response uh, on the medium plane. Uh, That? Yeah, it does actually. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're fixing some information about the orientation. Yeah. Of the pinna, yeah. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes, and also one last thing. Uh, for when you do general recording, I guess you take one mannequin and you put microphones instead of the team children. But yeah, after for you, 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 you are using headphones, but why not use directly? In, uh, in time, or in, in time headphones, because as yeah, you can see, yes, the yeah, intro, yeah. intro, I don't know, but because as you recall near the to the link, having your source at the same point. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a big issue because, uh, as I said, some in some approaches the responses are recorded at, at the entrance of the ear canal. Okay. With some other approaches, they are recorded as okay. close as possible to the uh, ear tone. So, if you use uh, either earphones or headphones, you should compensate also for the this little uh, tune of the ear canal or, or not. So, but you are to the track. That's not an issue. Yes, I have a Thank you very much.